Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to present a little presentation about historic districts and just kind of the differences between the two historic districts and um, if you're kind of interested in that and how that whole process works. Uh, my name is Abigail Enoch. I'm joined by Jamie Miles and Jessica Bean, and we're going to go into a little bit about Historic Districts 101. All right, to start us off, um, to kind of introduce us, we are part of the Cleveland Restoration Society, um, which is the largest non-governmental regional historic preservation group in Ohio. So we're a historic preservation nonprofit. We are um, headquartered in the Midtown area in Cleveland. We're in this little beautiful house right here, the Sarah Benedict House, uh, founded in 1972 with a million dollar operating budget, um, 34 trustees, 14 staff, and over a thousand members. So we've been doing historic, preserva historic preservation work in the Northeast Ohio area for um, a really long time now. So our kind of mission statement is that we use historic preservation to revitalize our communities, strengthen the regional economy, and enhance the quality of life in Northeastern Ohio. So you might be thinking, what is a historic district? A historic district is defined as a group of buildings, properties, or sites that have been designated by one of several entities as historically or architecturally significant. So usually in a historic district, your structures um, are divided into two different categories, either as contributing or non-contributing. So a contributing building is something that contributes to the historic district and a non-contributing one um, does not. So districts can vary greatly in size from just a couple of houses in a neighborhood to like a larger commercial district. And they're based on the density of significant structures in a given area. So the density of contributing structures to that particular um, geographic area. Historic districts are really important because they foster a real sense of community in everyone's neighborhood. Um, first of all, they kind of, you know, if all of the homes are taken care of and kept up to like certain standards, first it kind of makes the neighborhood look really inviting and really attractive to like new home buyers. And it also, you know, it creates a real sense of cohesion in the neighborhood, even if the houses kind of look a little bit different, but there's still a sense of, um, upkeep and uniform uh, cohesion that's kind of spread out um, throughout the area. It can also help educate residents and visitors to the area's history. So um, usually historic districts are set aside for either architectural reasons or cultural historic reasons. And so maybe that can um, kind of bring some insight into an area's history that maybe residents didn't know about before. It increases in property values if homeowners are, you know, keeping up their homes and kind of keeping them to the standards of the historic districts. And it's, like I said, just a really attractive um, place to live for new home buyers. And it also enhances the local economy, local economy by possibly using historic tax credits for rehabbing commercial buildings. All right, so some of the historic districts you might be familiar of in the Cleveland area are Playhouse Square um, on the top left, uh, there's the West Side Market area in West 25th Street in Ohio City. And then there's also Little Italy in the black and white photo um, down right there. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who's going to talk about the two different types of historic designations. We have our National Register Historic Places, or Historic um, Places, and then our state and local designations. Thanks, Abigail. Um, so the two main types of historic designation um, with National Register is the federal designation, and then there's also state and local. Um, main differences is uh, the National Register of Historic Places is an honorific title. So there's not any restrictions necessarily that get put on your home or your neighborhood if they are on the National Register of Historic Places. It is operated through the National Park Service and it does not protect against any kind of uh, demolition or alteration, but it is uh, a way to document the, those areas. Um, one thing that they do is it's, if there are areas that are affected by like federal projects, um, they do trigger special planning and consideration. So in the case of like a freeway being planned, um, it can't be, it has to go through extra planning to go through those historic um, or to affect National Register properties or neighborhoods. Um, there are tax credits that might be possible for homes um, for income producing projects in National Register of Historic Places districts or if the building itself is on the National Register, and it doesn't automatically make the property locally designated. So that's just the federal designation. The local designation um, also does not automatically listed on the National Register. So if you are interested in having your 
property or community on both. There are two separate, completely different processes to go through. Um, the lo same local are established through um, local approval and design and um, protections uh, depend on the location. So some cities do protect for those areas and some just have it designated. Uh, there is a, a design review board created by the city or the state that oversees any changes um, that are going to be done on those des designated properties. So there is always going to be that um, review and approval process if you are making changes in a state and local uh, historic district. So there are some that are designated on both. So you could have a property that's on the National Register and on the local historic district. Sometimes they overlap perfectly, sometimes they don't at all, um, and sometimes they're completely different areas. And so just things to think about if you are in a historic district, knowing what kind of historic district you're in and where those boundaries are or borders are when you're looking at either making changes to your existing home in a district or looking at purchasing within a district. The National Register districts have uh, five general categories to list on the National Register. Uh, buildings, structures, sites, objects, and districts. So it's not necessarily just one building. It could be a few buildings. It could not, not even be a building at all. It could be just a site, an archaeological dig, something like that. Um, the property or the buildings area um, does have to have passed the three evaluation standards for the National Register. The basics of that is that it's at least 50 years old, retains its basic historic integrity, and meets one of the four National Register criteria. Um, so it could meet multiple more of them, but it has to meet at least one of the four. Um, the first is significance for its association with broad patterns of history. Uh, two, it has to have association with the lives of persons significant in our past. Um, three, have architectural merit. And four, have the potential to yield important um, information in history or prehistory like archeology. span So a lot of homes in local areas um, usually are significant based on architecture, or um, the associated with broad patterns of history, depending on where they are, what happened in those areas. Um, a lot of the ones that are associated with uh, significant people, that's um, presidents, important historical figures, things like that. Um, so you could meet more than one, uh, but it has to meet at least one to, um, to qualify. The process to get on the National Register varies by state. And so um, if you're in a different state than Ohio, <laughs> uh, you should probably look up that process. Um, in Ohio, anybody can complete an application to nominate a property or a district. Uh, there's an initial questionnaire, an application, a comment period, um, review and edits by the um, Ohio um, Preservation Office Advisory Board, and then review by the National Park Service and an official designation. So this is a very intensive project. Um, the application is a lot of information and it does take time to get full approval, review, edits, um, and uh, the official designation. So that is, uh, it does take time. Um, it's not a quick process. Now the National Register districts in Cleveland um, are outlined here. This is a few of them and you can see there's, there are different sizes, shapes. Some of them are very small, some of them are big, very big. Some of them are on the border of another one. Um, and so it really just depends on when they were created, who created them, what the boundaries were at that time, and what's significant about those areas. Um, so that gives you the different uh, sizes and shapes, and um, you might have the contributing and non-contributing uh, buildings in those areas as well. Um, and when you think about what that overlap is, you've got the brown is now a kind of the local historic districts. So they don't always, as I mentioned, they don't always overlap. Um, in some cases here in Cleveland, um, there are some that overlap, but the National Register District is much larger than the local district or vice versa, or they're completely different places. Um, and so really make sure that if you are looking to, to purchase or work on a home in a historic district that you know where those boundaries are and that you know what processes uh, you need to go through to to work or make changes, or if you want to be on the National Register or the local design review, make sure you're not already in one of those districts. So I'll pass it to Jamie to talk about the local historic districts. Thank you, Jessica. So um, as she mentioned, there um, are the National Register districts, and then there are locally designated districts. And so um, because we're kind of based in Cleveland, where I'm going to be talking mostly about um, 
what the local historic district process is like in Cleveland and how that works. Um, it may be different for each, uh, you know, for different municipalities have different rules, um, different processes. So just keep that in mind. Um, generally, local historic districts are established through a local ordinance. So the designation is therefore protected by law. It, they're, that meaning that the um, local historic districts are generally stronger than um, a national register designation in protecting your property. Um, process, procedure, and protections, like I said, depend on location. Um, not all local historic districts have a design review process. Um, many do, that's not always the case. In Cleveland, uh, there is a landmarks commission, which is established by a landmarks ordinance. Um, the Landmarks Commission consists of an 11 member board made up of architects, historians, property owners, attorneys, um, Cleveland City Council representatives, the director of city planning and the commissioner of architecture. So um, people from a lot of different backgrounds and expertises make up the Landmarks Commission. Um, then that, so that is the commission, a volunteer, you know, sort of um, group of people. And then there's also the Landmarks Department uh, as part of the city government which is, uh, has two full-time staff members. So they kind of take care of all of the uh, logistics and administration that go along with it. Um, and they all follow the established criteria listed in that landmarks ordinance, including uh, So this is the uh, Cleveland City Planning Commission. And then the landmarks website is kind of a subset of that Planning Commission website. Uh, what you see here and on there if you're interested in checking it out you can see the full list of historic districts the locally designated historic districts in Cleveland um, along with the maps and then below that if you were to scroll down a little bit you can see all of the individually landmarked buildings in Cleveland um, so definitely a really awesome resource if you're interested in checking that out and uh, so here are just a few examples of Cleveland histor Cleveland's historic districts. Um, these are the ones shown on this slide are generally some of the more commercial districts. We have Superior Avenue, Prospect Avenue, um, Euclid Avenue uh, has a number of overlapping historic districts actually, but this one section of Euclid Avenue in particular, and then also the Broadway East 55th area. And then uh, this slide shows some examples of some more uh, residential areas that are designated historic districts in Cleveland. We have East Boulevard, um, which is a really large one, Brandwood Allotments, um, Brooklyn Center on the west side, Clifton West Boulevard. And then also we even have Myrtle Highview, which is one of the newer historic districts, has some, um, some mid-century buildings in it, a little bit different from many of the others. Uh, so, as far as local design review process is concerned, many of the, the local historic districts in Cleveland are paired with, are required to go through um, design review. Um, design review reviews building and demolition permits for designated landmarks and districts. So, at each a contributing building in a district would have to go through design review. Um, they use the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation to review proposed changes. Um, that is um, part of the what the National Parks Service uses, kind of the standard uh, for everywhere in the country uses that list of uh, kind of guidelines for uh, looking at changes for historic buildings. Um, local design review committees act as advisory recommending approval or disapproval to the larger landmarks commission for any changes a property owner wants to make. Um, the commission then issues a certificate of appropriateness for approval or disapproval of those changes that the property owner is requesting. Um, and then some examples of Cleveland's local design review areas include Franklin West Clinton, which whose website you see on the bottom there. Um, Ohio City has one, East Boulevard, Tremont are just a couple examples. So uh, what changes are subject to design review? Now, um, you know, if you are, are a property owner in a historic district, not every change that you're gonna thinking about making on your house is gonna have to go through design review. Generally only exterior changes are uh, things that design review wants to see. 
So, you know, any kind of interior renovations, you know, you're remodeling your kitchen, that's not going to have to go through design review. You can do whatever you want. Um, but things like, uh, for example, siding, windows, roofs, porches, fences, and additions, those are all things that would have to go through that design review process. Also demolition, if um, you wanted to demolish uh, an older home in a historic district as well. Um, they do follow that uh, standards that I talked about before, the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Um, they use that as their guideline to, to look over um, the, the exterior changes. Uh, they generally encourage repairing over replacing when possible, replacing like with like, and encouraging high quality materials. Um, and that's kind of a, some basic um, preservation uh, standards there. There, um, so as I mentioned, those that was some basic uh, information about Cleveland's local historic districts. There are also designated local historic districts in Cleveland suburbs. A few examples are the Butternut Ridge Historic District in North Olmsted, downtown Hudson, and Shaker Heights. They have Winslow Road and Shaker Square. Each of these um, in different cities, they have diff their own different rules, different design review processes um, for each of them. Uh, so kind of related to historic districts are historic markers. Um, we have the Ohio historic markers, which you might be familiar with. They're those large bronze signs. Uh, they have their own special process um, through the Ohio State Historic Preservation Office. Um, they, you know, cost like, I think it's like $2,000 or $2,500. They're usually sponsored by a government or a nonprofit organization. Um, but they uh, you know, have their own specific set of requirements. They're also, you might see local historic landmark district signage, like that Little Italy one we have on the right there. Um, there are also national register plaques. If uh, a property has been placed on the national register, that homeowner might purchase a national register plaque, to, uh, you know, showing that the property is on the list. Um, and then there are also century home plaques, um, which a, we, a lot of people uh, ask about. You know, they say my home is over 100 years old. How do I get a plaque? Um, so there are many plaque companies out there that produce historic plaques that you can just go ahead and purchase. Um, Cleveland does not have uh, a century plaque home plaque program uh, because many of the houses in Cleveland, probably in fact, the majority of the houses in Cleveland are over 100 years old. Um, so if you're interested in something like that for a home in Cleveland, you'd have to just go ahead and purchase that on your own. Uh, in other communities, there are local historical societies that have processes for distributing a century home plaque. You know, if you um, live in one of those communities, we have Sugar and Falls here, in, an example, and then also Strongsville, you can contact the historical society and figure out how to apply for one of those with them. Um, so also, we'll just use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the Cleveland Restoration Society's Heritage Home Program, which uh, we all work with. Um, the Heritage Home Program uh, is a program that offers free technical assistance and low interest loans for financing in participating communities uh, for eligible homes. Um, the free technical assistance is impartial advice with a preservation approach to maintenance, repair, and improvements on houses over 50 years old in participating communities. Um, if you're wondering if you live in a participating community, we do have that full list of those on our website um, at heritagehomeprogram.org. You can check that out. We also offer site visits to review any and all issues in the home, help with project prioritization, contractor resources, and restoration guidance. Um, we also have a loan program, which offers fixed rate financing as low as 2% to cover project costs. Uh, we can uh, take care of both interior and exterior projects with the loan. Um, DIY projects qualify, and um, there are construction specifications provided for exterior projects. Um, much like I was talking about with design review earlier, we do want to make sure the projects are done with, with a preservation mindset. And uh, that's all we've got. I hope you enjoyed our Historic Districts 101 presentation and learned a lot. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to reach out. We uh, Check out our website, heritagehomeprogram.org or clevenrestoration.org, our larger organization's website. Thank you so much.